There you are. Good to see you tonight. Comment issue. There we go. All right, comments are back. Good. Hey, Bill. Pauline, David, Bill. Who else is here? Judith. Good to see you all. Hope you have had a good, if chilly, uh, Sunday so far. Julia Tyson. Hey, Kathy and Scott. Hey, Nikki. All right, well, got the cat parked next to me. I've got one dog rolled up in a blanket on the couch and two others plopped on the floor between here and the kitchen, hoping Mom will drop food. Oh, no, sorry. Three dogs, all of them ready for food to drop. <laughs> hey, Suzanne. Chilly and rainy here all day. So you're saying perfect golf weather, Bill. I always admire people who go out and golf in this stuff. I'm not one of them, obviously. Don't play golf. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. They're all right. They are definitely happy that Roman's home again. They perked right up. There, 6.30. We are on page 63 tonight. Evening prayer, right one. And when you get there, we'll begin. O oh God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. On page 64 is the Fos Hilaron. Let us pray together. O gracious light, pure brightness of the ever-living Father in heaven, O Jesus Christ, holy and blessed, now as we come to the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the vesper light, we sing thy praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thou art worthy at all times to be praised by happy voices, O Son of God, O giver of life, and to be glorified through all the worlds. Our psalm for this evening is Psalm 145, which begins over on page 801. When you get there, let us pray through that together. Psalm 145, page 801. Hey, Mary. Hey, Rev. Good to see you both. We are on page 801, getting ready to read Psalm 145. Let us read together. I will exalt you, O God, my King, 
and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. They shall speak of the might of your wondrous acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is loving to everyone, and his compassion is over all his works. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make known the glory of your kingdom and speak of your power, that the peoples may know of your power and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all ages. The Lord is faithful in all his words and merciful in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all those who fall. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon you, O Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open wide your hand and satisfy the needs of every living creature. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving in all his works. The Lord is near to those who call upon him, to all who call upon him faithfully. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and helps them. The Lord preserves all those who love him, but he destroys all the wicked. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading for today is uh, the first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verses 13 to 22. We've been reading the book of James for the last week or so, and now we're in First Peter. We're poking around at the epistles, the letters that are at the far end of the New Testament. So this is good stuff. We don't often get out here, so this is good. All right, First Peter 3, 13 to 22. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to it. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Okay, so a couple of points about this passage. This is one of those New Testament letters that was written for instructing the church on how to be church. In the years that followed Jesus' return to heaven, uh, early Christians were initially convinced that Jesus was going to come at any moment, and so they lived their lives with the expectation that I might not get through you know, my work day, I might not even get through my meal, because Jesus may return at any moment. But after a time, people realized, okay, Jesus hasn't come back and we're still here, so we have to figure out how to be church in this, in this area. We look for Jesus' return, but we also have to live in the world where we are. So First Peter grew in part out of that. And it's interesting, uh, we are in verse 19. Some folks have asked me about the portion of the creeds, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, where it says Jesus descended into hell uh, and 
then was resurrected, right? And <clears throat> we get that in verse 19. This is an interesting little reference here where Jesus was put to death and then he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. The apostle implying that after Jesus' death and before his resurrection, he went to hell and, and exercised some sort of saving event to the people who were in hell. So that's where we get that passage, or that, that bit in the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed is from this passage here. Uh, also important to note uh, that this passage was first and foremost written for Christians in that time. So when <clears throat> the author is saying, you make sure and have a defense ready when someone challenges you about your faith uh, and that sort of thing, and being maligned for your faith and that sort of thing, we don't know the exact circumstances here, but the expectation is twofold. Number one, that this community would have been different uh, than, the, than the world around it. These little churches uh, sometimes grew out of Jewish synagogues, and so people would have struggled, right? People in the synagogue would have said, hey, look, you're not acting like a faithful Jew anymore. What's going on with you? What are you doing following this Jesus person? Uh, since there weren't a lot of rules and regulations and, and guidelines for how to be church, uh, it seems like often early churches fragmented on their own. Somebody said, well, I've got a message from God and you all should listen to me. And when everybody said, we don't know about that, they went off and formed their own church. There wasn't, you know, there just weren't boundaries like there are today. It still happens a lot, of course, but but um, in different ways there. So it's very possible as well that as some of these little churches fragmented and schismed, people would say, well, what are you doing? Are you really a Christian? I don't think you are because you don't follow the teachings of Father Peter or whomever, right? And you had to give a defense. You had to be ready to say no. So while these passages talk about suffering for doing good and things like that, they are, it's important to realize they're also contextual for that time because this author was writing to help encourage and instruct people in his world, we're tuning in 2,000 years later and drawing meaning from it. There's still a lot of good stuff there, but some of it not necessarily as easy to grab onto today and say, what? What are they talking about? So anyway, FYI. All right, uh, our canticle for this evening is on page 66. It's the Nunc Dimittis. The Song of Simeon. When you get there to page 66, let us pray that together. Page 66. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue with the Apostles' Creed. Please join me as you are able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear friends, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with Suffrages B on page 68. Please join me. That this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful. 
that thy holy angels may lead us in paths of peace and goodwill, that we may be pardoned and forgiven for our sins and offenses, that there may be peace to thy church and to the whole world, that we may depart this life in thy faith and fear and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ, that we may be bound together by thy Holy Spirit in the communion of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all thy saints, entrusting one another and all our life to Christ. collect of the day is on page 185. It's the Collect for Christ the King Sunday. This is proper 29, page 185. You're welcome to join me if you wish. Christ the King Sunday, that last Sunday of the church year uh, where we look forward to Christ's return. We're setting the stage for Advent, those four weeks leading up to Christmas, uh, where we look forward to Christ's return when creation will be restored when, as the Hebrew prophets wrote, the lion will lie down with the lamb, um, when all people will seek God. So this is page 185, proper 29. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in thy well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. One of the prayers I'm going to use this evening comes from this little book. Uh, Philip Newell is a guy who has been involved in Celtic spirituality for a long time. He worked uh, in Edinburgh at the Cathedral there, St. Giles. He worked on the island of Iona for a long time. For those of you that aren't really familiar with the uh, Episcopal Church and its Celtic roots, those are some spaces, particularly Iona off the coast of Scotland, that have been uh, places of worship for a couple thousand years now. And so he was the spirituality director there uh, on Iona for a while. And he's originally from Canada. Anyway, he's made his study Celtic Christianity and our deep roots there. And so these are our morning and evening prayers for the days of the week uh, based around that. And so his Sunday evening prayer goes this way. Thanks be to you, O God, for the night and its light, for stars that emerge out of evening skies and the white moon's radiance. Thanks be to you for the earth's unfolding of color and the bright sheen of creatures from ocean depths, in the darkness of the world and in the night of my own soul. Let me be looked with longing for light. Let me be looking in hope. Amen. And if you would turn with me to page 840, we'll pray prayer 8. Hey, Robert, good to see you. Page 840, prayer 8. This is for the beauty of the earth. It kind of dovetails with what we just prayed. We give you thanks, most gracious God, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. We praise you for these good gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment of your abundant creation, to the honor and glory of your name, now and forever. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give thine angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, Shield the joyous, and all for thy love's sake. Amen. At this time, I invite your thanksgivings and intercessions, silently or aloud.
lift up my friend Julie to you and her family, particularly Corel, uh, and the neighborhood that they live in, Logan, for Holy Trinity Bethlehem Church, where they worship. I give thanks for Jennifer Lee and the excellent work that she did leading worship and preaching today. I give thanks for each person gathered here. I lift up Kathy and Scott to you, ask for continued healing, and peace, love for them. Uh, I lift up Melissa to you as well and ask for continued healing for her. And I lift up Terry and Agnes as well. Please bless each person gathered here, their family and their other loved ones. Hold them close, keep them safe, bring us all to the morning light uh, and deepen our love for you. Amen. final prayer this evening is on page 71. Page 71, the general thanksgiving. When you get there, let us pray together. Page 71, please pray with me. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, to give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. My friends, let us bless the Lord. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Good to walk and worship with you, friends. Good to see you. I hope that you have a blessed evening, and I'll see you back here tomorrow at 6.30 for evening prayer.